Guess okay. We'll find out. We'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Hello. Let me uh, introduce you guys to Georgian. How do I say your last name? Uh, Avasil Kutsi. It's kind of hard for, uh, yeah, <laughs> for other like people. The, the tongue, yes, but you know, <laughs> I'm, my tongue is primitive. I remember I lived in the Czech Republic for a um, for a year, and they were telling me how the kids in the Czech Republic they go to school just to say the R. You know, it's <laughs> and I was like, oh man, that's intense. Uh, so um, tell me, Georgian, what what do you do uh, for a living? Where, where do you work? What are you doing now? Where I'm a freelance character artist. Nice. I'm currently uh, under contract with uh, Warner Bros. Mm -hmm. And uh, I live in Romania. Nice. For now. I'm working uh, mostly remotely. Okay. That's uh, great. What does a what does a day look like when you're freelancing? Like, or do you have to work on their schedule, or you get your own schedule? No, mostly I'm uh, working on deadlines, mm -hmm. so I make my own schedule. Uh, it, it depends only on me, but usually I'm on a nine to five uh, daily work time, my time, yeah. not theirs. Yeah. Are you're not one of those late workers that works until midnight and what not? Well, I, I used to be like that uh, a few years ago, but uh, I tried to to sort my, my schedule. Yeah. Be a bit more responsible now. <laughs> Getting older and older, it's it's kind of hard. Oh man, isn't it? Right. I mean, if I don't get uh, <laughs> at least if I don't get seven hours of sleep, oh my lord, it's not pretty. There's way too much coffee in the morning to solve that problem. Uh, so, what got you into this? What talk, talk to me about your education? I'd love to hear. Are you from Romania? Yeah, I'm from Romania. Uh, right. I don't have any art background. Uh, I, just a long time ago, like 15 years now, mm -hmm. I, I got on a copy of 3ds Max 4, I think. Yeah. And, and I got hooked instantly. Yeah. So how, how long ago was that again? Uh, 15 years. Okay, got it. So in 2003. Nice. That was back when the computers like could barely run Max, right? Or my yeah, I know. Well, the, the internet was with the modem's uh, 56k, so uh, the internet was only at the beginnings. Yeah. When it comes, especially when it comes to 3D, there were so little resources. It was a a long way on working, like just click that button and see what it does. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's awesome. So, what got you into it? You just you just developed, or you got the software and you started playing but you know what yeah, was the bug? I, I was a gamer before that you know okay. and i always uh, thought about how how they do that thing for games how how do they model those and when i found out actually that they are using 3ds max i was instantly hooked mm. you saw the connection you're like oh i can do this yeah but well romania at that point was uh really far behind the the modern countries yeah. uh, were coming after the communist uh, era. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of undeveloped uh, in this area. So I had to, to study by myself and try to, to learn what I can from, from the internet. But as I was saying, the resources were nowhere close to what we have nowadays. I know, right? The kids today, they're so spoiled. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I see you do a lot of spoiling. I mean, you've got a ton of tutorials out here. Yeah, well, I'm trying to give back to to the community. They they always always been there for me. So I think uh, that if I didn't have uh, any tutorials to to guide me when I was young, maybe some kids will skip that five years I wasted uh, doing uh, FX and animations and all that stuff that I really don't need uh, now anymore. Mm -hmm. Because oh. I was just testing the software, I didn't have a a straight road uh, that I, uh, a definite idea of what I was going to do with this. So it was more like testing everything and learning nothing. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, wasted a lot of time doing all kind of uh, stuff, except what uh, I actually had to do. Well, what was the first job that you got as a CG guy? 
Well, I worked in a in a media studio. Well, a really small media studio in uh, in my hometown, Yash, yeah. in Romania. Mm -hmm. We're like six guys, and we're doing uh, commercials and stuff like that. It was a lot of two uh, D work, but it it involved uh, later some three D work also. Mm -hmm. But I was just at the beginning. I was just modeling stuff. I had no clue what UVs mean or how to play some texture on my uh, on my assets. But I, I I was getting better and better at modeling. And uh, after a few years, I I decided to to enter the the gaming industry and move to Bucharest. And uh, got a contract uh, here in a studio in Bucharest. There were only two studios here. And uh, from there, a lot of uh, hard work and uh, contracts and uh, decided to go as a freelancer after a few years. I started uh, looking for uh, for studios that would work with uh, people remotely. Mm -hmm. I had the, the opportunity to work with the guys from Don't Nod. They were at the beginning. Uh, they just opened the, their studio. They were working on Remember Me. And they needed uh, cheap people because, let's be honest, uh, at that point, uh, Romania was a country where uh, the artists were really uh, poor paid, poorly mm -hmm. paid. Yeah. So uh, they lend a hand. I worked with them for seven years. But uh, I, I will always be grateful for, uh, for the fact they, they took me when I had so little experience. Yeah. And I learned a lot uh, during those years. After that, uh, I got better and better. I switched from, uh, in the beginning, I worked as a prop artist. And then uh, I switched to characters. And uh, I got the opportunity to work for uh, for Arcane, for Dishonored. Mm -hmm. And uh, from there, everything went uh, better and better for me. That's great. So you started as prop. What was the transition like into character? Was that something that you had planned from the beginning or? Yeah. In the beginning, uh, when I was learning modeling, I always uh, dreamed of making characters for me. And that was the the whole goal. But uh, having bills to pay and so on, I, I realized that doing props, it's, uh, it's easier for me to get a job. Yeah. And uh, to be honest, I think the the whole experience, learning to do hard surface and all, uh, helped a lot for uh, for my character uh, work that I do now. That's interesting. I I've noticed that with some of my students too, because people get into character and they think it's all organic sculpting. You know. Yeah. No. It's it's probably fifty percent. <laughs> organic 50% uh, hard surface. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're working on a sci-fi game or something, you might end up doing just hard surface all around. And if you only have the organic skills, then you might have a hard time. But yeah, uh, I think the, the, the years I spent as a, as a prop artist really helped me as a, as a character artist. How, how did the transition work? Did you, you just had to take like a freelance job or did you, did they? Uh, no, uh, I switched to characters uh, during uh, uh, my second project with uh, Don't Nod. Okay. Uh, which was Life is Strange. Mm -hmm. The characters were not complicated, kind of stylized and simple. And uh, all my personal projects were uh, in this direction. All my personal projects were uh, characters. So uh, I asked them if they need more character artists and they said, yes, they knew that I can do the job uh, as a prop artist mm -hmm. and they let me try. So they were happy with my test and from there I got into making characters. But uh, as long as I worked with, uh, with Don't Know, I made characters and props because there were few characters, maybe a few months of work then uh, another year of prop work. Right. And what is, um, I'd love to know more about freelancing. You know, I, a lot of people that come in have done some element of freelancing into my boot camp. have done some element of freelancing before and whatnot. But, you know, how do you, how'd you go about finding those jobs when you were first starting? 
you know, I imagine it's a different equation now, but you know, when you were first starting, how, how did that, how'd you approach people? How'd you start to see who's, who's working without sourcing and things like that? Yeah. My first job, the job with don't nod. Yeah. Uh, that my first, uh, good job, let me say was, uh, after following up, uh, an article on a 3d site. And there was a post in a forum. They were looking for, for artists. I replied, they gave me a test and they, I got hired, but, uh, I don't know. I was uh, being on sites like uh, Get a Freelancer or uh, Freelancer.com or whatever, mm -hmm. and uh, sadly those are not good sites for for freelance jobs, especially for three D artists. Right. Because uh, there are a lot of people with low skill, but from a poor developed country that will outbid you for anything. Right. And you won't won't get any contract. So I I'm always saying that. Uh, you need to push yourself and make a decent portfolio and uh, the right people will see you. Also having some connections will help because uh, the contract for Arcane, for example, I got it uh, through a friend whom uh, I worked with uh, a Don't Nod, then he was working with Arcane and he asked if I want to join. And of course I jumped in the boat. So it's a, uh, it's tricky, I know. It's uh, it's really difficult for a beginner to to find contracts. But uh, I think if you if you put the effort into a portfolio, it will happen. But at, well, at some point. Well, that brings us to like, what what do you think is or helps somebody make a successful portfolio? What do you think people are looking for in a portfolio? Uh, I think people are looking for nice things. Yeah, let's put it this way. I don't think that uh, necessarily uh, the recruiters or people in the industry that have a word to say about hiring uh, some other people are looking for anything else, but they need to to first see something that will catch their eye. Mm -hmm. They will bother later with the topology, UVs, uh, textures, uh, the technical parts. But the most important thing is to, to have uh, things that look nice and uh, that are completed because I see a lot of people that uh, post are posting uh, only sculpts or uh, whips mm -hmm. and uh, waiting to get a, a job, which will probably not gonna happen because they expect you to uh, to see that you can deliver a, a, a product, a final product. Right. Yeah, I've seen that a lot as well. It's like this, some people might, you might take a negative perspective on it and say it's this, this industry doesn't take a chance on anybody. But at the same time, you know, there's so much complexity to this that, you know, it's really important to show that you know the skills and that you have the capacity and then they take a chance on you from there, right? Yeah. So what do you think are some of the important characteristics to showcase, when, especially today, if we're if somebody wants to be a freelance character artist, so, you know we've got um, we've got several people on this call right now that are interested in being character artists. What do they need to put in their portfolio? Do they need to showcase marvelous designer? Do they need to showcase any software specifically? Have skin renders? You know what what really helps them? Uh, uh, you know, be the package. I think uh, there are some must know softwares nowadays, mm -hmm. especially for characters like, you got to know ZBrush or Modbox, but ZBrush mostly. And uh, you need to know Marvelous Designer because at this point, any AAA title will use Marvelous Designer to, to simulate clothes. No one will stay and spend a month to sculpt some really nice clothes anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, then you'll probably need either software or quick soap for texturing since uh, these are well mostly substance nowadays because uh, they took a big step ahead of quick soap. but uh, you need to show up that you you know how to use the softwares that are usually in a in a production pipeline mm -hmm. um, I don't know what to say more about this uh, what about so, so saying yeah 
no, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. I was going to say, so that's software, but like what else about the work itself? Is there something that triggers it? You know, like, so for example, I'm, I'm on your art station and I'm looking at the Amunet, I think is, is it. And if I'm looking at uh, Amunet, the full character, you've got a whole tutorial on this and, uh, and it's right there on your art station. I'm looking at that kind of beaded necklace kind of deal. And, um, all the work that must have gone into it, right? So, you know, it shows me right here the level of uh, attention and detail and, and whatnot that you're putting into this stuff. Um, but in terms of the work itself, like, you know, what what should people strive to be representing? Should they have the facial anatomy 100%? Should they have skin? Should they have lots of detail and parts and props to the characters? I think the more detail you put into a character, uh, the better it will look in the end. Mm -hmm. I think uh, a lot of people hurry up and, uh, for example, when sculpting a character, yeah, they make some basic shapes, then go and put up uh, micro details for the face, you know, yeah, without uh, taking into account all the subtle uh, volumes that are, are, are missing. And I think, uh, any recruiter or uh, anyone from a studio that want to hire someone will will look into this kind of uh, attention to details. Mm -hmm. And uh, as it is for this character, uh, the whole purpose of it was that necklace. Uh, everything I wanted to do was to, to test myself if I can put the effort in it to make it look believable. And I think you you always need to push yourself and try to to do the the most complicated and the thing that you're most afraid of cuz people will see that you put that effort uh, people will appreciate that if you're just going to make something to have something at your portfolio and not spend enough time trying to put all the detail possible in it then it will show up and and it will be easy for others to see that i think they the recruiters are looking also for uh, for the mentality, not just for the quality of the work. Hmm. Interesting. What do you mean by that? I mean, like, they want to see that someone it's it's ready to give up, uh, to put a lot of effort into everything they are doing. Hmm. That that they are not afraid to push the limits, you know. Yeah, Cause... that makes sense. I don't know, I, this 3D uh, world, uh, it's becoming bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. And I see a lot of portfolios and uh, uh, I've made some uh, portfolio reviews on my Twitch uh, not long ago. Mm -hmm. and, a lot, and a lot of people are uh, coming and say, why do you say my work is not good? Why do you say this is not right? You know, Because I put effort in it and I'm always saying, yeah, you put some effort in it, but I can see that you you didn't spend enough time to make sure every volume is proper. Because it's not, if you can make a character from scratch to, to final product, then it means you have the skill to make it right. You just need to spend more time on it. Mm -hmm. So the the internet nowadays, it's it's filled with the, characters that are are decent but not good enough no. I get that yeah that makes a lot of sense the, I always tell the students that the the key thing here is you have to dive deep and you have to dive deeper than the guy next to you you know because that's this industry is looking for more and more realism you know and they're pushing that technical boundary and as they push that technical boundary I you correct me if I'm wrong but I think the industry is definitely experiencing a, a shortage of people that can can take it all the way. Yeah, I think he, uh, I know. For example, I know my portfolio. It's not good enough. It's something that I'm constantly working on, even after so many years working in this industry. And I'm always trying to to make stuff that I'm really afraid of. It's the same thing that happened with uh, my hair tutorial and mm -hmm. the hair I made for the characters. I was so afraid of making hair that I push myself for every character to make hair as good as I can. And when I found a, a workflow that it's good enough, I, I decided to, to share it uh, with, with the other uh, artists out there. Mm -hmm. 
it's it's just pushing your uh, your limit for for every character you're making and i think it will be appreciated in the end right it cannot be yeah no that's great i love that um so if we're looking at your work um do you get a chance to do a lot of personal work or is it all work work or how do you mix the two uh, i i have this uh, thing that if i'm working 8 hours on my job then i will will spend at least two, three hours doing my personal projects every day. There is no day for me not to work on a personal project. Even if I'm streaming, because lately in the past two years or so, I'm streaming all my personal projects mm -hmm. on Twitch. But I'm trying to stream to, to be with the community and try to, to make something new. Because the industry progressed so fast and the tools are getting so so good that if you don't push yourself and you're not making new stuff, people will forget about you and you lose your your skills, even if you're continuously uh, working on, in a studio. But in a studio, you learn a workflow and you might uh, apply that same workflow for three years on a project. But in three years, the industry changes a lot. There are new shaders, new tools, new softwares. And you always need to, to learn new stuff. I don't know. Yeah, that makes a I lot of sense. I feel like you need to put a lot of effort into your personal projects. My portfolio has just a few uh, characters that were made for, for work, mm -hmm. like the ones from Dishonored and uh, what I made for uh, War Machine. And the rest, it's just personal work. That's great. I'm constantly working on that. Yeah, and I see you always take them all the way. You know, there's not a lot of whips posted here. It's just, you know, it's like even the Billy Three Arrows real-time character, you know, and you're taking that all the way. Yeah, well, it was a challenge. I'm I'm always telling people that uh, if they want to learn something, they, they should join any challenge mm -hmm. because you will have a deadline, which is you will always have in production. Yeah. So you need to get used to work under pressure, even if you're you're gonna be lazy in the beginning and you'll say, oh, I have two months to finish that. Right. But when the time will get to the end, you might wanna push yourself to finish it. So you might spend 12 hours every day to finish that character. Even if it's not good, you still learn something from from trying to meet a deadline. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Now, that, that, that's, I think we've covered quite a bit of bases here and um, and you do a lot of training and you do a lot of uh, streaming, I think you said. So I'd love to kind of learn a little bit more about how maybe that's impacted your career, um, your freelancing, you know, if you get job offers, like let's start, I guess, with the Twitch stuff. Um, how has that affected your, your career and, and what you do? Uh... I don't know. I could have worked by myself, you know. But in this industry, people need to know you to to get to get a job, you know. Mm -hmm. It's uh, the exposure. It's really important. So any by any means you can uh, put yourself out there, you should do it. So I decided to stream because it's a it's a really easy way to to meet another artist. Mm -hmm. And uh, to force yourself to work because when you're streaming, you're not going to take half an hour break. You're not going to go for an hour and walk around the building and then get back to work. You're going to stream there and, and if you'll take a break, it will be a five, ten minutes break. Then we'll get back because you don't want to uh, lose the interest of the people that are watching you. So for me, the Twitch was more like uh, something to to push me to to keep working all the time. Career-wise, I think uh, it didn't really help me mm -hmm. that much because uh, probably the most recent contracts I got were because my portfolio was uh, how it was and uh, because I worked on Dishonored mostly because people, when it, they see Dishonored 2, oh, okay, we know that game. It's a cool game with a cool uh, art style. And they look at your 
my portfolio and they see, oh, okay, he can do some realistic characters. Yeah, that might suit our uh, our uh, project. So let's see if this guy is available for work. But uh, the Twitch part was only to to share something with the community, though I'm a little bit disappointed about the numbers of people that are actually uh, joining me on Twitch. Mm -hmm. I have a constant number of, I don't know, 20, 30 people that are uh, are watching with me every time I'm streaming. But uh, for an industry that big and for the number of followers I have everywhere, it's, uh, it's kind of sad they are not interested to see uh, my workflow, you know? Because mm -hmm. I'm there to answer their questions, to to guide them if they need guidance. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm looking at this arcane, um, the Dishonored Two work, and this comes up a lot in the in the boot camp because it's realistic, but it's also not right. There's some stylized qualities to it. And um, and so if I'm looking at your work here, the Dishonored Two work, if we scroll all the way down. Um, there's this one where you're doing um, uh, it's this uh, kind of meaty guy and he's in this uh, he's got a suit jacket on and he's got these kind of red checkered pants and um, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking you know that yeah exactly this sculpt on this you know do you do the sculpt on this is this done in marvelous like how are these things developed because it's just got such uh... a beautiful Feel for this character, yeah. I did only the texture, mm -hmm. says right here. But the process uh, for the characters in Dishonored were uh, they didn't involve uh, uh, Marvelous, mm -hmm. it was just uh, blocking out in 3ds Max or Maya uh, the overall shapes. And the guys from uh, from Arcane had such a strong team of 2D artists that all we had to do was to to copy their concepts perfectly and it, it would have been fine. There were like every fold, every uh, uh, proportion of the character was already drawn mm -hmm. and we we only had to copy it and uh, make it work. So it was, since the folds were really big and uh, uh, exaggerated and so on, it was really easy to block out the shapes in the beginning and then just sculpt a little bit on top to to improve the overall look of uh, of the high poly yeah and again mostly for for the uh, designer work was uh, the work on the textures which were somewhere in between realism and uh, uh stylized got it it's kind of the same thing i did for uh, for Billy Three Arrows, for, mm -hmm. for the Art Station Challenge. You take a, a realistic texture, you make a realistic texture. For most of the textures, I use Quixel Suit for Dishonored. And uh, for the expansion, for the DLC, I used the Substance because they integrated it in uh, into their workflow. But for Dishonored 2, the game, <coughs> sorry, I, uh, I used Quixel, made a realistic texture then just paint it on top of it to make it, to give it that painterly feel. Mm. And combined with the, the really high less, highly stylized uh, high poly, it gives a really nice feeling for for it, for, for the, every character in the game. Yeah, you know, and that makes me, that brings me to a topic because, uh, you know, one of the things that's really important to me in the boot camp is, um, is Substance Painter, you know, and I tell, people and I probably mentioned it all the time in in these interviews is if I was starting out today I, I wouldn't really touch ZBrush I'd get into substance because that's the software that's making the biggest impact in this industry right now um, and so you know one of the issues we have in substance is that it gives you so much level so much realism but then there's also so much damage and there's all you know you can build this like layer stack that goes you know 20 feet high three-story layer stack um, but I'm looking at the texture work that you have here it imparts the information that's necessary it's got the roughness it's got the wear um, but it looks designed it looks like you know it it looks like art as opposed to somebody's like overdone the curvature mask so to speak um, 
what what is your process for texturing when you're doing this? You know, are you working with the tools inside Quixel and Substance and and creating a layer stack? Or are you relying on 2D stuff? Uh, I work a lot with the uh, Substance and uh, Quixel, and I'm uh, it's it's a thing I'm always saying to everyone in my stream or wherever uh, whoever asks when you're working with Substance. If you're just going to use default materials and the default uh, generators, mm -hmm. you will see from 100 miles that that character was made in substance. Right. But if you use a generator, then you apply a paint layer on top and you break all the damage and you try to make some gradients in in damage and dirt and everything, trying to replicate what how it is in real life. Because if you look at these characters, they are really dirty on the lower side. And the way you go up, they're cleaner and cleaner. Maybe yeah. that was not a perfect example. But look at this. He's practically uh, all dusty here mm -hmm. and no dust on, on the upper side. And this kind of gradients help a lot selling the, the, the texture. And that's, that's one of the things that... Uh, I'm working a lot on when I'm texturing. I'm, of course, I'm stacking materials. I'm stacking uh, uh, all kind of uh, generators and everything. But in the end, it's, uh, it's the effort I put into every uh, dirt spec and every interesting point on, on the texture. Like making you know, his shoulders look like uh, it was affected by the sun. So mm -hmm. they're discolored and then put some uh, rough patches on, on his uh, elbows and on his knees. Like the that cloth actually had some uh, uh, some wear that makes sense. Got Most it. of the people right now I've seen, uh, they're just putting a smart material and they're expecting that to be the final result. But it's it's more than that usually. Yeah, I love this. I love the um, the mentioning of the gradients too, because like if we were looking at that guy's jacket, you know, you can tell the shoulders are bleached out, but you know, and it's a subtle difference, but they're bleached out, and then the guy's, you know, and then the back of it is blue, so the color's there. So this is a, a great, and gradients are pretty straightforward to add to that, you know, to some extent. It's just a position mask, even. Um, yeah. So that's a great, I think, tip for people to stand out. Is there any other advice that you that you commonly give people when they're dealing with textures specifically on how to make those textures stand out and not look, you know, like, oh, this is basically everything in substance? Well, one thing that really bothers me about substance is that all the height map of all the materials, even if they are there from... Uh, the default substance or from substance source or mm -hmm. custom materials, they have a lot of detail in, in their height, mm. which translate in their normal map. And everything looks really, really noisy all over the place. Mm. So usually I'm tempering that down a lot and uh, just keep keep things pretty much simple. It's the same I did for, uh, for Billy. Yeah. These pants that are on him, were really, really heavy when it comes to to the normal map because of the the height. But tempering it down, playing with the with a separate layer with a, a, a flat normal, just to simulate some uh, wear, it will help a lot sell sell the fabric. You know, like another thing, it's uh, the leather. Most of the people when they have a character and they have 10 straps and some boots and some gloves, they'll put the same leather in it and they'll leave it like that, even if they are gonna make some edge wear and stuff. But having different uh, colors and uh, different values for, for your leather will help a lot. Like this belt, it's practically orange. This is really uh, light and this is dark. Mm -hmm. And even the part here on the boot is it's, it's different from uh, from the rest of the boot. And it, to be honest, I think it's it takes more than just putting some materials, but it's more about gathering references and always checking them because most of the 3D artists 
think they know how something looks. But in the end, it's not like that. Even for me, I tend to, to make leather and then I go back to the reference and I'm, oh, okay, uh, I didn't do good here. Maybe I should rework this damage or the way it's, uh, uh, the leather uh, had uh, aged. So when it comes to texturing, I think it, it's really important to check your references and uh, and give attention to every detail, not put damage all over the place. Because if you lose a generator in in Substance or in Quixel, it will put damage wherever the curvature it's uh, uh, it's white or something. But it no, it won't work because in some cases there will be no way uh, for something to hit there and actually leave a a mark. So just make sure you you work on your mask. Cool, I understand that. So this concept by Tony uh, by Tony Sart. Are there any other concept artists, any other illustrators, um, or just artists that you know you really admire and and love to kind of um, pull inspiration from? Well, there are plenty of those. Yeah, <laughs> uh, they're, they're, the list is so long. Uh, of artists that are really good. If there's one uh, that you think um, you know you'd really love to share with these guys and with the audience, you know somebody whose uh, whose work really kind of fits with your vibe. Does anybody come to mind? I don't know. Uh, let me think. I think uh, there's this guy, another Romanian guy, Hugh mm -hmm. Tell, which is a concept artist. Let me see if I can bring him up. That he has a really nice style for mm. for his concept work. Mm -hmm. And that's H U E and, uh, and then uh, T E O. T E O. Yeah. All right. Is somehow I'm really into fantasy stuff, and uh, he does a lot of work. Uh, mm -hmm. Really cool. And in this direction, which I find it uh, really amazing. Yeah. Well, I don't know. There are so many artists. I'm always on our station checking people work. It's it's absolutely fabulous what you can find nowadays. There are so many artists, really good artists out there. Yeah, and art station such an amazing resource now too. Yeah. So, uh, all right, we're close then. I guess we can say goodbye to the podcast audience soon. And if you have a moment, I'd love to get your eyes on some um, some students' works who are here. Uh, so, guys, we, we only have a, a bit of time here, so make sure that you post links to your work in the chat. Um, but the last thing before we let go of the podcast audience would be, you know, what advice do you give people on your streams um, who are looking to become character artists? Is there any, like, is there one thing that if they focus on that one thing for the next six months, their chances of getting a job increase exponentially. Yeah, make sure your volumes are right and put all the effort you can into it. If you have five minutes free, just go and sculpt something. There's no other way than putting the effort into it. Yeah. That's great. I mean, I've seen that time after time. There was a student of ours now, I don't even want to call him the student now, but Niles Rush. Um, and he spent six months on a model. And when they, people interviewed him, they looked at that one model and that was that. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't look at another model. They didn't care. They were just like, you're hired. And he's at Motion Picture Company working on feature films now. So That's great. That, yeah. I, I'm always saying people, work hard, put the effort. It will show up. What about people when? And what about when people? Because you know, you, I'm sure you've seen this. Like people get kind of far on a model, and then they say, "I'm done." All right, I'm done with this now, guys. I'm going to go start another model. And then you and I, you know, we're looking at it. We're like, "Yeah, you, you, sure, you're at stage two, right?" But yeah. you got more to yeah. do. So, what advice do you give to people who are like, "I'm just done," and they feel like they need to move on? Well, uh, to be honest, in this industry, you're never done. No character is done. No matter how much time you'll put into it, in the end, you will still find something to, to work on. Because 
I'm finishing a character, I'm happy with the way it looks, then I go back after a week and I, I see all the errors that I could have <laughs> repaired and I'm always, maybe I should have spent a few more days working on it. Yeah. But you, you, you have no our station, right? Before you had other sites to, to look for work. Mm -hmm. You know, you can see what, what a top artwork looks like. You know, if you go on our station and you go to, to activity and you can even uh, activity, sorry, if you go to our station and uh, go to community, right? Where you get the feature, the most important things. And if you're a character artist, you can go here and say only characters, right? For digital 3D. And you can see the best artworks. There are those big things here after every refresh, you know? So you know what you, you need to actually do is to get as close as possible to these ones, you know? To make them look as good as possible. So you have an idea about what the level should be and when you need to stop working on your character. Mm -hmm. If it's not there, then just put more effort into it. No one is asking you as a beginner to, to make a character in three weeks like they're asking a pro. Okay, spend six months. No one is saying not to spend six months. But after six months, I'm sure you're gonna deliver a character as close as possible to, to a top artwork on our station. That's awesome, yeah. All right, well, I think that covers our bases. So thank you so much for coming in and sharing your advice and for um, for showing us your work. That was really great. No it was great problem. to meet you. Thank you for having me here. Absolutely. All right. Well, everybody, um, just uh, let's make sure I've got your art station up so everybody knows exactly where to find you. Uh, it's just artstation.com forward slash uh, nimlot, N-I-M-L-O-T. That's where they can find you. Get your, uh, You've got a bunch of tutorials on there on Quixel and uh, Marvelous Designer and a bunch of other things. And uh, so thank you so much for putting out so much great content. That's really cool. No problem. All right. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye, guys. Thanks. Bye.